Shalom. Today we are returning to the Gospel of John. We are discussing things from the Hebrew background of the Gospel. So it says in John 5, verse 1, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Yeshua went up to Jerusalem. We know that there are three festivals which are commanded to go up to Jerusalem, that is Passover, Pentecost, Shavuot, and Tabernacles, or Sukkot, but we don't really have enough information here to know which of these feasts that it was. Previously, we saw that there was some indication from Yeshua having been with the Samaritans, and maybe the fields were white unto harvest. Maybe it was four months before the harvest. It's just not clear which feast this is. Continuing in verse 2, Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity thirty-eight years. So the words which are in brackets do not appear in some manuscripts, and it does appear that this whole idea might be of a pagan origin. However, there are some legends of healing waters in the rabbinical literature, that there was such a healing virtue in the fountain of Miriam, which was in the Sea of Tiberias, and it happened to be the time when the well of Miriam flowed, that he swam there and was healed. It is said that this well was opened on the merits of Miriam, which at her departure disappeared. And we do know that the water did stop running after she died. This is a picture of a more recent excavation, which people do believe to be this pool of Bethesda. There are five porches there. There was a fresco uncovered. I couldn't find a picture of it from 1888, which includes this area with the uh, angels and also five porches. Now it mentions that the man was there for 38 years and there is no excess verbiage in the Bible. There is another period of 38 years which we read about in Deuteronomy 2.14. And the time we took to come from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed over the valley of Zered was 38 years until the generation of all the men of war was consumed from the midst of the camp, just as Yahweh had sworn to them. How are these two ideas related? It seems like that the people had been in the land for about two years at the time that they sent out the spies, and the spies came back with an evil report. And so, due to a lack of faith on the part of the people, they were given another 38 years, leaving a total of them being in the wilderness for 40 years. But it was a distinct period of two years and then an additional 38 years. Continuing in John 5, verse 6, when Yeshua saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. He didn't answer Yeshua's question. It was a yes or no question, but he doesn't exactly give an answer. So maybe that is ref reflecting a lack of faith on his part altogether, and that is why those two periods of 38 years might line up. Yeshua said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The rabbinical leadership is always looking for an, an excuse to accuse Yeshua of not keeping Torah. In Tractate Shabbat in the Talmud, there are 39 major categories based on the types of work that were related to the construction of the tabernacle in the wilderness, which ceased on Shabbat. So they start with this list of 39 actions that were related to the construction of the tabernacle, and they rested on Shabbat. So out of these 39 categories, there are many under each one. And so they come up with hundreds of different activities which are forbidden on Shabbat that come under these 39 headings. But we can see that the very first one is carrying, and that's what they're going to nail him on. 
Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with him healing on Shabbat. And there is no law. There's no, nothing here that would prevent you from healing on Shabbat. They're going to catch him on the man carrying his mat. At the same time, they make many rules about how to get around these things. So, for example, you can't, can't send a letter someplace, but if you give it to a Gentile and it will arrive after Shabbat, somehow then it suddenly becomes okay. So we see in verse 10, The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is Shabbat. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, he who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Yeshua had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward Yeshua found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. I think it's a very important verse. It confirms the fact that sickness is the result of sin. About that fact, much has been written. Continuing in verse 15, the man departed and told the Jews it was Yeshua who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Yeshua and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on Shabbat. But Yeshua answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Shabbat, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So the verb that he said that God was his father is in the imperfect tense. In other words, he's continually, he kept calling himself. It wasn't just a one-time infraction in their, in their eyes. He was continually calling God Elohim his father. So we're going to wade a little bit into the murky waters of the sons of God. There's a lot of discussion in the Jewish literature about what it truly means to be a son of God. The first place we find this is in Genesis 6, 1, 2. I'm sure you're familiar. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, the words there in Hebrew are b'nei ha-elohim, saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and that and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. This phrase, B'nai Elohim, only appears in these places. Again, in Genesis 6, uh, concerning this same group of people, whoever they are. In Job 1 and 2, it is clear that the B'nai Elohim come before Father in heaven with Hasatan, so they can't be human beings. And again, in Job 38, we will look at that. One of the verses which is uh, often discussed with reference to this idea of the Son of God, who is the Son of God, is in Psalm 2, verses 6 or 7, and then again in verse 12. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. Yahweh hath said unto me, Thou art my son. The word is Ben. This day have I begotten thee. And then in verse 12, it's translated in the King James, Kiss the son, but there the word is Bar lest he be angry and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Now the word bar is a much later Aramaic word for the word son. You hear it in bar mitzvah, which is a later ritual established by Jews. It is used in one place in the earlier literature. In Proverbs 31.2, it's used three times. What, my son, it's bar, and what, son of my womb, bar. And so that's obviously referring to a human being. And what, son of my vows. That's the only place where it is literally refers to human being. In later literature, in Ezra and Daniel, it is used often to mean son, like the son who is a human being. The word bar has other meanings, though. So this is the actual verse, uh, Psalm 2.12 in Hebrew, and we see the first two words, nashku, bar. So nashak does mean kiss, but it comes, from, it comes with the idea of uh, embracing or holding something very tightly or maybe hugging. Bar, for one thing, it can mean corn, but I don't think, or some kind of grain. I, think, I don't think we can go there. Uh, in this context, it can also mean purity, something which is untainted. So we see these various translations over time. In the Septuagint, 
and the Vulgate, Nashku Bar, which in the King James is translated as kiss the sun, is translated as embrace. Okay, we see the embrace, discipline, maybe. The uh, Jewish Publication Society from 1917, the English translation is do homage, Nashku, okay, barb, impurity, we can see that. Koren, which is also another Jewish translation from 1967, says worship in purity. I guess the idea of having that kind of closeness, embracing, could be translated as worship. The Targum from the first century of the Common Era says accept instruction. Aben Ezra, who was a commentator uh, wandering around the 11th or 12th century, looks at this verse and he says that it is properly spoken of the Messiah as being the Son. But then there is a disputation about is he really the Son, like the Son in the flesh, or is just this some theoretical thing? And later he confessed that maybe he's one like the Son of God in the same sense of, of the Proverbs verses that we looked at, or that maybe they just understand it as an angel. So it's a big discussion whether God can have a son. Uh, it's interesting that they had the same discussion in Islam, where they come to the conclusion that God has no son. On the other hand, we read in Matthew 16, 16 and 17, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Yeshua answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. You see the bar there, so that now we're in the first century is in Aramaic, he's saying Simon, the son of Jonah, but it's a much later language edition. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It seems like Peter didn't just like check something in his spirit and say, wait, God can't have a son, so I can't possibly say this. The idea of God having a son was extant in the thought of the first century and the thought of even Simon Peter, who was just a fisherman. There's another verse, which is rarely quoted, in Proverbs 30, verse 4. Who has ascended into heaven, or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? Obviously, we know that this has to be talking about God. Then it says, what is his name, and what is his son's name? The word there is Ben, if you know. So there is this idea, even in Proverbs, that God, the establisher, founder, and maker of the whole universe, can have a son. It's written right there in Proverbs. Continuing in John chapter 5, verse 19. Then Yeshua answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. On this last verse, I would just like to add that many people would like to give Orthodox Jews a pass and say, well, they honor the Father. Maybe they don't know the Son, but they honor the Father. I'm here to tell you that they, in fact, disrespect the Son entirely, and it's very clear that when doing that, they do not honor the Father. I think we need to be very careful how we walk this out. See that Yeshua will raise the dead. Hallelujah. So in the way that he is like the Father, the world doesn't recognize him, as it's already been written in chapter 1. Isaiah 1, three: The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people do not consider. Jeremiah 4.22 For my people are foolish, they have not known me, they are silly children, and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. Jeremiah 10.12 and also 51, 15 are the same. He has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom. He has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. As we were talking about Job 38, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. 
or who stretched the line upon it, to what were its foundations fastened, or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all these sons of God shouted for joy. Were there human beings created yet? Hmm. Now previously, in chapter 1, verse 12, we read this. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Just looking into the Greek for a minute, we see that in John 1, 12, the sons of God is tekna theu. Tekna is the word that means children. It does not specifically mean sons. We can contrast this with the Septuagint version of Genesis 6, 4, where it says, for the sons of God, e e to theu, if you will excuse my koine pronunciation, e eos is the word for son, specifically masculine child. So there are two different concepts there, even in the Greek. Later, we're going to see that the leadership challenges him for comparing himself to be the son of God, to making himself equal with God. And he returns this verse to them from Psalm 82, 6. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. So right here, he says, ye are gods, Elohim, but the children, the B'nai, is of Elyon, the Most High. And then he says, if he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. So obviously, the word of God came to those who are some kind of B'nai Elohim or Elohim. There's a, a lot been discussed about what does this really mean, the B'nai Ha Elohim, the sons of God. We can know with confidence that we are children of God because we have received the word. The word is planted in us and we bear his fruit. Next time we'll go on. In the meantime, Tasimita Inayim Ahashemayim, keep your eye in the sky. Every day your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.